Welcome to the 21 Report. I'm Frank Pesci, and I'm here with Jeff Younger, loving father, Army veteran, successful entrepreneur, a proven leader, champion of family values, and gender sanity. Jeff, how are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Jeff, you came to the national forefront because you had a case mm -hmm. in family court that brought you national acclaim. That's right. Would you care to talk about that? Sure. Um, it started when my son was two years old and my ex-wife, who's a pediatrician in Capel, Texas, uh, began to transition my son to a girl without my consent, even when I was married to her. And when I pushed back on that, she filed for divorce and used her connections with the psychologist in the area as a physician and forced me out of the house and socially transitioned my son. And this uh, eventually culminated in her enrolling him in school as a girl. The school district actually transitioned my son without my consent or my knowledge. This is the Capel Independent School District. I would take my son to school in boys clothes and the teacher would give him a dress and make him use the girl's bathroom and they would use a fake uh, female name for him. And this went on for a year before I knew about it. So uh, that, that culminated in a big trial in 2019, where the top transgender experts on both sides of this issue lined up at the 255th District Court in Dallas, Texas. And I, I got the original experts from the original John Hopkins Clinic uh, that opened the first transgender clinic in the 1970s, um, where this whole scientific movement began. They shut their clinic down after four and a half years because their evidence showed that they were harming patients with those treatments. Um, but we see a resurgence of this now under, um, under a political ideology rather than a medical treatment concept. And uh, she brought in experts like Johan Olson Kennedy. Um, I deposed her and I asked her a simple question in the deposition. I said, what justifies you in cutting healthy body parts off of children? What's the medical justification for that? And her answer was, well, if those body parts are causing psychological distress, they're not healthy. And she admitted that she had personally referred over 250 pubescent girls for total mastectomies. And as a result, they didn't put a single one of their expert witnesses on the stand in front of a Texas jury. Uh, Texas juries would have not liked to hear that evidence. And the, the court gave me 50-50 custody and no child support and ability to check my ex-wife from doing anything to my child, including socially transitioning. But I'm facing down a very powerful law firm, which is the largest donor to judicial campaigns in the state of Texas. Um, they're very well connected in the legal education network. And they were able to get that judge recused and they got me put into the most liberal uh, court in Dallas County, the 301st District Court with Judge Bloody Mary Brown. And Judge Bloody Mary Brown refused to implement the jury verdict, completely contrary to Texas law and the Texas Constitution. She put me under an illegal gag order, which gave me a permanent lifetime ban from doing interviews like this. This interview is actually illegal in the state of Texas. Um, and I have just told the court I'm not obeying that. And I, I went about telling my fellow citizens what was happening to my son in Texas courts. And eventually I ran for office in order to change those laws because I, over two legislative sessions in Texas, I could not get conservative Republican legislators to pass laws against a castrating little boys. And so I said, well, I have to go do it myself. So I ran for office. The governor of the state of Texas, uh, Greg Abbott, and the Speaker of the House, Dade Phelan, spent combined about $3 million against me to keep me out of the House. So I've been a huge political force in Texas, not, not because of anything special I do, man. I mean, I'm not even temperamentally well suited to lead democratic movements, honestly, um, but but when it's your son on the line, you learn fast. And by quantitative measures for my bills to outlaw this transgender child abuse, we, we generated more political force than for any law in Texas history. There were some uh, legislative offices getting 300 lobbyists a day in favor of my bill. And we still couldn't get it passed. So right now, the current status of the case is that um, this liberal judge recognizing that she has no political way to transition my son in the state of Texas, just, uh, just four or five days ago, gave my ex-wife uh, permission in a court order to move my son to California and put him under the new draconian SB 701, which Gavin Newsom signed only four days ago. So you can see this is well planned. And uh, California is now a sanctuary state for, tr for transgender kids. And uh, as soon as my son enters the state of California, I believe he'll be sterilized and chemically castrated. Is there any way to stop that? 
The only way I can stop it in the Texas court is to go up on mandamus because the family courts in Texas are so bad that you cannot even appeal these rulings. There's no right of appeal for these rulings, amazingly. So I have to go on what's called a mandamus, which has an incredibly high standard of proof. 99% of these are denied in Texas. And I'm gonna to have to just get a higher court to order a judge not to do this to my son. I just order this judge to rescind her order. I, I suspect that the fifth appeals district, which I'll have to go to, uh, will deny me that, but I believe that the Texas Supreme Court will actually stop this judge from doing it to my son. If he gets to California, I will have to challenge the California law in federal court because this law is so bad, it denies the full faith and credit of all other states in the union. So California will not obey subpoenas from states who wanna know if those children are okay. Like if I, I'm in Texas, it will not obey subpoena, Texas subpoenas. It will not return the children to Texas. The courts are required to take jurisdiction over the children. And, and lastly, California has enabled district court judges to transition children and chemically castrate them without parental consent if the judge thinks it's in the best interest of the child. Can a federal court stop this? That's what I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to go into federal court if my son's make it to California and we're gonna challenge it up there on the full faith and credit clause. Will you be able to have time? If they move to California and they decide that that's day one a priority. It's, it's been made clear in the law, they will not grant a stay. So I'm gonna to have to get an emergency stay in federal court and work my way up to the Supreme Court because I, I will have to file suit in the, the federal district for California, which I anticipate losing in. So I'd have to go up to the appeals district and we'll probably wind up at the Supreme Court over this. That was my question. Yeah, and, take the and that's court. the plan. And so I'm budgeting about a million bucks for this. I spent about 1.4 to 1.7, depending on how you, how you calculate it, million dollars keeping my son from being castrated. And I guess I'll spend a million more in federal court. I know you're a good father and that you actually care about your family and you want decisions to be made the right way. Yes. There is no more sacred relationship than uh, parents to their children. That's right. It's a God-given relationship and children have a duty to honor their parents and mm -hmm. we have a duty to honor our children mm -hmm. and how we raise them and treat them. Yeah. So I understand I understand where you're coming from and I offer my prayers to you. And Thank you. I could say that um, after first seeing your case on TV, I think 2017, Okay. I remember thinking like, oh man, that's that's tough. Wow. And, but you become disconnected because you see it through the TV and you're just like, right. uh, poor guy, that sucks. Yeah. But then here I am, I come to a convention and I meet you. Right. And I say, hold on a second. After you know finding out who you were and yeah. hearing your name, I said, wait a second, this is a regular guy. I'm just a dad. This is a I'm dad. Just a dad. This is a gentleman. But you're not, you're not ill-equipped. You're a very brilliant guy in the, the conversations that I've had. Okay. I spent time listening to your speech. How do you fight this battle you mentioned, you know, bringing up very specific law and precedent to force a stay or force a change of venue or, yes. or you know, intervene into this case. Yeah. How do you have time to live regular life, run a business, be a parent to your children and prosecute this case from your position? You know, man, uh, you make time for what's necessary to protect your children. And I have to make a lot of money to protect my children. Um, I have to pay a lot of child support. I pay way more than maximal child support in Texas. Um, and, uh, you know, what I do is I just allocate my time very carefully and I don't sleep a lot. And uh, um, I've tried to use my, my, my brain more than my brawn. You know, I've tried to fight smart and hit, hit the enemy where it really hurts them, where it can have an effect on the case to help my son. Um, you know, I've, I've gone to, to big donors in Texas to, to influence the governor, Speaker of the House, and other legislators. I've made, I've made no secret uh, that I will destroy the political career of anyone that lets my son be harmed. And it, it's very clear that they understand that I can do that now. And I have uh, built a network of, of voters in Texas, and I'm prepared to use them. In your speech, you used uh, a frame of reference. You said that your battle was against the zeitgeist of our times. Yeah. What does that mean? So the zeitgeist means the spirit of the age. You know, every age has um, a kind of animating principle that, um, that outlines the horizon of acceptable thinking. It, 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 it determines what kind of questions you would ask 
it would, it would uh, even delineate like what, what types of answers would be acceptable. And our, and our current zeitgeist is very strange to people like me. Um, we, the dominant view of most people now is that their sexual identity is the primary determinant of the self. And this sexual identity is an identity that they can ter- determine. And uh, it's completely socially constructed with no reference to biological reality at all. And, um, you know, the, the, just the classification, for example, of gender dysphoria by the American Psychological Association it used to be called gender identity disorder, meaning it was something wrong with the person. They had disordered ideas. Gender dysphoria <clears throat> means something's wrong with the wider culture because they won't accept a natural human variation. So we've reached a point where bizarrely to me, our sexuality has become the almost the only determinant of who, what kind of person we are. And it's not even considered a behavior, but a status that you possess. Um, and I don't believe any of these things, and I don't believe that um, you can stop this transgender movement. I don't think you can stop the transgender child abuse of children if we don't understand that we have to reject completely that view of the self. But doesn't an adult person have the right to choose how they want to live? Yes. Humans have the right to choose how they want to live. Societies have the right to reject their way of life as well. Ostracism is a right that all societies have. And what you see here is an assault on all norms. So the the, the idea is that you'll hear them say, well, gender is a social construct, which surprises many people, but I agree with that. Um, Gender is a social construct. Well, that, that, that seems to imply to most people today that any form of gender construction then is okay and equivalent to any other. But it's actually not true, right? So we have to have a conversation in which we can defend traditional social norms. And what we have today is an attack on all norms, particularly around sexual norms. And the future of this attack on sexual norms will be now that we're, we're actually uh, sexually mutilating children, and that's become normal. Now that we're doing that, the very next step is sexualizing children. And um, children as sex objects is already happening in places like California. Have you found strong voices that exist within the American medical complex and psychological complex that are sympathetic to your case? No. There are no strong voices that uh, will speak out against this because they're all professional cowards. Um, Last 21 convention, not this one, but the one before, we had two psychologists on a panel. And I asked the question of them. I said, under the rules of the American Psychology Association, can can you gentlemen, as psychologists, you have a child who's come and presented to you with gender dysphoria, under the rules of the APA, can you help him identify with his biological sex? And they both admitted that under the rules they would not be able to do that. The rules of the psychological profession and psychiatry, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, the American Medical Association, all consider that reparative therapy. So doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists can only help children take up an abnormal gender identity that's different than their biological sex. Do you currently have a relationship with your sons? I haven't seen my sons in one year and three months. I frequently write them letters. I write a combination of different kinds of letters. Some of them are oriented towards telling them what I'm doing. Some of them are are actually written for their future selves. Should I never see them again, they'll need my advice and they'll need to carry my values into the future. So it's written to their future selves when they're old enough to understand. And some of them are written to their current self and what they're doing in school. How are you able to sustain in this fight? Um, Prayer and fasting and doing good works. Do you feel like the Lord has come alongside of you to give you strength and support, angelic ministers and things like this? Um, I'm unfortunately, um, I have not been given a gift of discernment of these things. Um, All I know is that God makes my duty very clear to me and I do what he commands. Understood. And I ask you that because um, a prevailing 
principle that has mm -hmm. driven this convention so far. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of guys uh, who are speakers, who are influencers, who have been speaking about spiritual things. Yeah. And how their evolution of their message, mm -hmm. their purpose, their assignment uh, has been driven by revelation or just an understanding mm -hmm. and discerning of the times. Yeah. Now, few people have a battle as large as yours. Mm -hmm. That will readily admit that. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you some of the things that I approach this with from a spiritual point of view. Um, first of all, you know, I will just admit as a sinner that I have yet to be able to pray for my ex-wife. And I, I mean, I can say the words, um, but I, I, I'm still sinning because I can't pray for my enemies. I struggle with that. Um, I frequently do night prayer. I wake myself up in the middle of the night and I pray for the whole world and all the children in the world. And I do that almost every night. Um, and that has given me tremendous insight. Um, God has provided me a tremendous insight into not only my problems, but a lot of other problems uh, from, from the practice of, of daily prayer particularly waking up and doing it at night when the world's very quiet and the world around me is asleep and I can pray for them, for those people who are not awake. Um, fasting has been a big part of, of helping me as well. And uh, that's, you know, fasting from food. I, I fast from television and all sorts of things. Um, and that allowed, you asked me how much I get time. Well, I don't do television. I don't do, you know, one of the things I have taught my boys is that a fundamental principle that you have to live your life by is do nothing useless. Avoid all useless activities. Mm. And by doing that, I can be immensely productive. Yeah. Does coming to an event like 21 Summit, an event that Anthony has put together mm -hmm. for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years yeah. now? Yeah, he's an amazing guy. Does this regenerate you? Yes. Um, it's often the case that I'm facing my enemies and I'm usually surrounded by my enemies. You know, I go to court or when I'm in a political battle at the Capitol, um, I'm surrounded by enemies. Um, it's nice to be surrounded by allies, and I don't get that opportunity very often. Are there any speakers here that influence your way of thinking? It sounds like you don't spend a lot of time consuming content. It sounds like you are the one generating content yeah, yeah. with your actions. But was there anybody in particular at this event that mm -hmm. you were able to connect with or, or spoke with you that gave you an insight that maybe you hadn't considered before? Yeah, I, I continually get real nuggets from Arthur Quanley. Excellent. And um, that's the reason I joined the Genesis Council with him. Um, I, I think that, uh, and this, this is a definitely an orthodox uh, position on the created world, um, but orthodoxy looks on the created world the way you might look upon an icon in a church, right? It, it is, it's signs and it, and it teaches us and tells us a lot about the divine intelligence that, that created it. And when I talked in my speech about the social imaginary and how the social imaginary creates the, uh, the, the horizon of acceptable thought, that social imaginary is best created and best uh, modified by art. And that includes movies, writings, and things like that. It's, it's through the artistic medium that our imagination is stretched into different areas. And our enemies have been very, very skillful at using arts. For example, the mainstreaming of trans transgenderism, particularly even for kids, has been done primarily through entertainment mediums, right? So Arthur Kwan Lee is onto something very important that really no one else is talking about. And I find his insights incredibly valuable. I had a great interview with Arthur. I really enjoyed speaking with him. And in our conversation here at the table, I, I really just learned so much. And he has a tremendous amount of insight. He does. Into how arts communicate to us. Yeah. He's actually probably the smartest guy at this convention. Yeah. Honestly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I probably don't disagree with you. Yeah. He was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and I myself, you know, we had the conversation about being discerning about the art that you hang in your house. Yeah. Because that's your sanctuary and, and that art 100%. is communicating to you. 100%. Are you diligent about the type of imagery that you surround yourself with? Yeah. And it was, this is actually uh, very surprising to a lot of people who come to my house when they see the kind of art that's in my home. So okay. first of all, as an Orthodox uh, Christian, we believe that every home is also a church. So at, in every spot somewhere in an Orthodox home, there's something called the iconostasis, and that's where we worship in our home. Is that like an altar? It's, it's an altar, plus there are icons, usually candles, okay. incense, everything. Everything you'd see in an Orthodox church is present on the iconostasis. So I have many, many icons 
all throughout my, my home. Um, Christ Pantocrator is the one that you see right when you come in. Mm -hmm. um, Saint Elizabeth, who's a great protector of children, um, is also there. But, you know, if we look at secular paintings, you know, in my dining room, people often remark on this. Um, there's a, there's a, a famous painting of the monk Parasevit, the Orthodox monk Parasevit, killing the commander of the Golden Horde of the Mongols um, at the Battle of Kulikovo. And Parasevit didn't actually know how to fight. He was not a warrior. So he arranged for a mutual kill. He sacrificed himself. And the loss of their commander led to the only defeat of the Mongol army in history. And the Russians defeated them there and saved all of Europe from the Mongols, Mongol horde, their second invasion. Um, the other painting is, uh, is a painting of uh, Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, at the Battle of Tours, which inaugurated the reconquest of Spain from the Muslims for the Christians. And uh, people are often taken aback by the battle imagery and uh, the, um, the uh, kind of, uh, of, of image that's depicted, a heroic image of violence. And uh, that is definitely a value that I try to impart to my sons, that uh, violence itself is something neutral. It's the use to which it's put that determines whether it's honorable or not. So we live in a time where uh, overt violence is not acceptable unless yeah. it's done within the framework of a battlefield or mm -hmm. self-defense of a home, Yes, for instance. But violence is actuated through other means today. Mm -hmm. What other classifications of violence would you identify as being overt violence other so, than on a battlefield. So there's, um, there's a, first of all, there's just straight up political violence on the streets. You see this with Antifa. I myself was involved in an Antifa riot at the University of North Texas. I was giving a speech there and they shut my speech down. They spit on me, uh, they threw bodily fluids on me. They used all of their intimidation tactics, but I wouldn't go away. Most conservative speakers just go away after five minutes, you know? When, when they can't do their talk. But I was like, I got an hour and a half speaking slot. Just protest me for an hour and a half. Let's see if you got the balls. What were it. you speaking about? I was speaking about the laws that I wanted to change in Texas uh, to protect children from transgender child abuse. And they just were not gonna let me speak on those issues. Um, so eventually, 400, three to 400 Antifa, depending on who you ask, the, the Department of Public Safety says it was, it was closer to 400, surrounded the building and tried to burn it down. So they evacuated the building. I got a rib broken. Uh, when they evacuated me out the back, a guy tried to choke me out. I was able to get able grip out of it. Um, they tried to pull me out of a police car, tried to overturn the police car. The police could only get away by running over one of them. Um, so, it, I mean, I've been through Antifa riots, so there's definitely that kind of violence. Then there's, then there's um, a kind of social violence that's perpetrated against us. You know, where people smear our reputations, they try to cancel us from our jobs, they try to take our livelihoods. In order to, if they think they think that if they take their our money, they can take away our voice, right? Um, and then there's there's direct uh, political violence perpetrated in the courts. You know, um, I've never had a jury verdict implemented by a Texas judge. I mean, it's it's very clear that judges are largely unaccountable in family court, and uh, fathers, millions of fathers, are losing their rights to their children. And this is this is a, a particularly onerous form of political violence because it affects children in such a direct way. Are there other cases that are happening that are like yours? Yeah, there are tons of cases like mine. Well, why aren't these parents speaking up? Where are they? We never hear or hear about them. Are you familiar with them? Yeah. Do they reach out to you? How they are do. you familiar with them? They do. They call me all, I get, I get dozens of calls a month. And what is your advice to them? You have to suck it up and protect your child. And the best way to do that in a democracy is to inform your fellow citizens about what the government is doing to your child and get your fellow citizens to join together in a political movement to stop it. And they won't speak up. They're all afraid to violate their gag orders. They're afraid they'll go to jail. You know, I tell them, okay, you, maybe you go to jail for 100 days. Okay, that's three hots in a cot, almost near infinite leisure, and plenty of time to plan your political moves when you get out in six months. Like, how bad is jail? Like, you know, the impending removal of your son's testicles is a lot worse than jail. Like, there are a lot of things worse than jail, right? But we have so many people with a conventional morality. It's not really even a conventional morality. It's a, a conventional way of life 
Well, they, could, they just couldn't tolerate the reputational destruction of having been put in jail, right? I, I tell my judge all the time, put me in jail. I'm violating your gag order and I'm never following it. So you need to put me in jail. And I'll, I have a writ of habeas corpus already prepared. I'll just take that right up to the Texas Supreme Court and we'll see who's right. And you know, they won't do it because they'd lose. So instead of, you know, instead of putting me in jail, they took my kids to try to coerce me to shut up. And that gag order was actually put on me to prevent me from running for political office. That's how corrupt the system is. They don't want me to get anywhere near legislators and lobby for laws that would constrain their ability to hurt kids. And now, these, these parents are cowards. They won't speak up. Now, you did run for Congress recently. I did. I ran for the Texas House, House District 63. And? So I, I, uh, I made it into the runoff. So we had me and a liberal established candidate, so conservative versus liberal. Here's a dirty secret that we don't ever talk about. We know that Democrats are fixing general elections, right? I think everybody knows that. It's certainly true in Texas. But Republicans have been fixing primary elections for a long time. And that's the kind of deal they've worked out with the Democrats. We'll fix primaries and you fix generals. And we'll both look the other way. And so what happened in my case is this is a, a textbook uh, method that they use in Texas. They go to the conservative candidate. They gin up some uh, fake uh, moral outrage against them with lots of mailings and lots of negative ads. You know, I had a, had a friend of mine in South Carolina. They actually had uh, uh, audio of a fake rape that they played against him. Fake rape. He was never involved in anything like that. Woman screaming and everything. With me, they, um, they, uh, God, they did everything. They said that I was in, involved in domestic violence. That's not true. They accused me of being gay. That's not true. They, uh, they said that I was abused my children, that I had been convicted of child abuse. There's, I've never been convicted. I have no criminal record at all. Um, but they did all this, and what that does is it splits the vote from the conservative candidate. So now you have a split Republican vote, right? And then they make a deal with the Democratic Party to bring in three to 5,000 voters to swing it for their candidate. And how do they get the Democratic Party to do that? They make deals with them like, well, we won't, we won't do legislation on transgender this session. You help me get my candidates elected and we'll avoid that law. That's why my law, my bills were killed for, for two legislative sessions. They had made deals with Democrats to kill those bills. So are you a content producer? Do you put things out there for people to consider and consume other than, I you do. know, of course, being running for Congress and uh, having a case that is such high profile? You're obviously being put on the news. Things are happening. Are you otherwise a content producer? Like, do you have fans? Do you have people that watch your work and want to connect yeah. with you? Yeah, um, I have a Substack. Um, it's uh, jeffyounger.substack.com. Just one word, Jeff Younger. Um, and you can connect with me on Facebook. Um, Facebook is almost kind of like a blog feed for me. Um, and then I spin off very in-depth articles on Substack. I don't, um, uh, on my Substack, I don't deal with uh, you know, current political issues. There are a lot of good substacks that do that. Um, and I link to them, ones that I recommend, right? Go, go there and do that. What I'm interested in is one, the intellectual causes of these political problems that we're having. How do we get here? Um, two, how can we change it? And how can we get out of it? I'm more focused on those issues. So for example, if uh, someone were interested in understanding why I, I oppose all forms of liberalism, classical liberalism, free market liberalism, left liberalism, libertarianism. I, I oppose all forms of liberalism. And I, ha I have a series of articles on why liberalism is really a sham and why it doesn't make sense. Um, why there were certain structural errors in the Constitution that doomed it from the very beginning. There were errors. For example, the, they, they really believed, the founders really believed the judiciary would be too weak. And so they made it very hard to remove judges. But now we know the judiciary is by far the most powerful branch of government and they can actually stop the operations of the other branches. So there were some errors that, 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 that were in the Constitution. I look at those kinds of things that most conservatives just won't confront. I also talk a lot about propaganda. And I try to help people understand how to spot propaganda, um, how it's produced and how the people who produce it think about how to, how to make it. 
Um, and where you can go to find news sources that are, are telling you the real facts on the ground and how to find independent people. You know, for example, when we're in the middle of this Ukraine war, you can get people who are there on the ground doing video. You don't have to rely on Reuters right, to get your, your news. So I try to help people do, navigate the, the world that way. I don't focus on the current events, but how we got here and how we can stop it. Jeff, what is your message to the world? If you don't stop the left's advance through the institutions and transgender, child trans, tra transgender transitions are just emblematic of that march through the institutions, if you don't stop them now, you'll never be able to stop them. Jeff, what benefit would a man get from coming to an event like this where there's so many common shared ideas, common stories, uh, and really just a desire mm -hmm. towards being a better man and in the 22 conventions case, towards being a better woman, personal growth, all that good stuff? Hmm. Let me, let me put it this way. So you, you know I'm a boxer. I like I do. Box. I do now. You wouldn't approach learning how to box by sitting in a classroom and learning how to box and then go in the ring and successfully pull it off, right? That's not how you learn how to box. The way you learn how to box is you go to a boxing gym and you don't know anything about it and you hang out with boxers who are good mm -hmm. and you start doing what they do. And eventually from copying them, you can handle yourself. And then there comes a point, it's the, I call it the journeyman stage, right? Where you realize you're gonna make some little adjustments and you're gonna start coming up with your own style of boxing, right? What the 21 convention is, is that first stage, all right? We, we're in a crisis of masculinity. There are very few masculine role models anywhere in the media. You have to come to 21 convention. It's like a boxing gym. You're gonna learn how to be a man by being a man among men. And you learn it by doing it and, and being with men. And that there's those, those opportunities in our society are very rare. There are no male spaces, spaces left. 21 convention actually may be it. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. For the 21 Report, I'm Frank Pesci with Jeff Younger. Thanks for watching. Thank you.